this this question had come in um, earlier to us from a client, and I'm going to sort of throw it out again, which is that you know there's been a lot of focus on uh, consumer AI, like whether it's Chat GPT or uh, you know um, you know things from Meta, but I know that Cadence is doing a lot of things on enterprise data and AI solutions like Jet AI, and so. Uh, this client was just hoping you talk about bringing AI into your product portfolio and how it kind of impacts cadence in the future. Absolutely. And of course, AI is a big topic. You know, it's a huge topic these days. And and some people say it's like overhyped. Some people say it's just the beginning, you know. And also one issue with AI is that, you know, people call everything AI. That's one issue. <laughs> and right now, almost everything is rebranded as AI. You know, that's not just true with companies, that's true with universities. Even if you look at universities, they're rebranding computer science and AI. So there's a little bit of, I mean, there's a lot of good things in AI, but there's also like, what do you actually call AI? You know, what is the definition of AI? Uh, but I do think that the, the the newer AIs, because, you know, some of the AI or machine learning could be just regression that was done for years, right? Or curve fitting. But some of the newer technologies in AI are truly transformation. It's truly transformational. And I think we can talk more about that. You know, I have an opinion on how transformational AI could be. And I think we are in the very, very, from a technology standpoint, in the very, very early innings of, of AI. And especially the last few years, some of these advancements in, you know, these transformer models, foundation models, you know, these large uh, models powered by, you know, GPU training. So, so, so for us, you know, there are three ways that we we participate or leverage AI. So, and and I think a lot of times people compare AI to the internet, but I do think it's like more foundational than the internet. But even if we just compare it to the internet, what happened in the 90s? So the first thing I believe that happened with the internet is the infrastructure part, you know, the build out of the infrastructure or the networking, you know. So in AI also, that will be the first thing, which is this, and you can see that now with NVIDIA and other kind of AI chips. You need these chips to, because you cannot train these AI models without running them on this special purpose hardware, okay. whether it's GPUs or other things. So we are, you know, deeply partnering with all the companies that are building these chips. Of course, NVIDIA is, is, the, is the key leader, but there are other companies, you know, like, like AMD and then like Tesla, we talked about system companies doing their own chips. You know, Google have talked about it. You know, Meta has talked about it publicly. So almost all the big companies are building AI-enabled products. So either they're at the data center or they're automotive or they're embedded. So that's a big part of our customer. And that will be the first kind of monetization of AI will be the infrastructure build out. And we are central in that, you know, helping to build that. The second part, so this is more of a horizontal enablement of AI. And then there are vertical enablements of AI. So the first, the, and this thing happened with the internet as well, if you wish you make the comparison. So the, the vertical enablement is like putting AI in your own product, okay? Whether it's like designing chips or, you know, Google search or, or you know, PowerPoint, you know, or writing code. And I think that will be significant. So we have invested for years into these newer, you know, this generative AI or reinforcement learning based algorithms. And they are very, very good at optimization or now what is called generative design. Because I think AI orchestration can, what it can do is that it can uh, automate a lot of the mundane tasks that the designer is doing or any human is doing and make the designer focus on higher value, higher uh, tasks. So that is true in the design process. To the design process, a lot of it is, uh, even though we have very powerful tools, I mean, a lot of time our users are spending, and that these designers in these great companies are spending, is running our tools, running our products, you know, changing some parameters, running again, because they're searching the design space. Okay? And typically what happens is, you know, for R&D for our customers, about 10% is going to automation, to like our kind of software, and 90% is going to people, okay? That's the typical, roughly, you know, it's, it's slightly, it, it has gone up over the years, so now it's slightly more than 10%. It used to be slightly less than 10%. So 
So that's what is happening. But a lot of that is mundane work that can be automated with AI. Especially if the chip complexity is going to increase significantly. Okay. So the chips are going to get 30, 40 times more complex in the next seven years. You know, we can get into why I think that is. So there is no way that our customers or in general can hire 30, 40 times more engineers. You know, that's not going to happen. They will still hire more engineers, like maybe two, three times more. But the remaining 10x gap has to be made up with automation. So there's a big opportunity of like if a customer is spending 90% on people and 10% on automation, I think the overall R&D budget will grow anyway. But the share of that automation can increase, can go much higher than 10% as more and more of the mundane tasks can be automated. And I can give you a lot of examples of, you know, our software with AI. You know, we have special generative AI tools that can improve the productivity by 10x of the design process, can also improve the performance. See, that's the other thing. So there is a productivity improvement, but a lot of times the design is better that can be done manually because the AI is doing it mathematically across all design space. So in a lot of cases, we can get 10, 15% better power or performance or area than a manual design. So that's a huge value to our customers. So that's the value of AI sometimes ignored is that the result can be better, you know, not that result can be faster because it's a more comprehensive search of the design space. So I do believe that it can give a lot of value and the way we can get to that is our, you know, in terms of monetization, is the customers will spend more on automation, less on people. But this will take time as a percentage. I mean, the number of headcount will still grow, but there's an opportunity to do more automation there. So that's the second uh, part of AI. So the first part was horizontal build out of infrastructure. Second was applying it to our own products, you know, and, and, and this will happen in search, it will happen in other areas, but there's a huge opportunity in chip design because it's very complicated and system design. Now, the third part of AI, which also happened in internet, for example, is new products will emerge that are only possible with AI, or that is only possible with uh, with internet, To just to complete the analogy. You know, things like Twitter or Facebook was not even possible without the internet, right? So, so and that's the third stage of AI, you know, and that will take some time. It may take like five, 10 years for them to emerge. So the question is what new products will emerge that are not possible right now, okay? So AI at its core, and we can talk more about it, it's a pattern-based science, you know, it's like data pattern-based science. So I believe that they would be multi there could be multiple new products that can emerge, but the most promising in my mind is life sciences. See, in the end, like the medicine, has to, you know, we, we, we have worked for the last 30, 40 years to put like computer science and physics together with semiconductors and all, right? And chemistry. But I think biology and computer science in the end have to merge. And that's the biggest value, you know, one of the biggest values to, to humanity. So there is a lot of potential of life sciences and AI, which of course your viewers will know. And so we also investing in that. And this is a longer term investment. So last year I bought a company to do numerical simulation of molecules. So just like we simulate chips and systems, the same math can be can be applied to simulate molecules and for mm-hmm. drug discovery and development. It's a very exciting company. There are only three companies in the world at scale that can do that, and we bought one of them. And then there is a lot of potential to apply AI on top for, for life sciences. So, so from a cadence standpoint, the three ways we are looking at it is, the first way is the infrastructure build out for AI. Second way is applying to our own current products for chip design and system design. And third way is, is computational life science. 